we at OrthHub are excited to be hosting this global webinar with the International Orthopedic Diversity Alliance. We have many shared goals, so it's a privilege to be partnering up today. Many of you are new to OrthHub, so just briefly, you can find us online at www.orthohub.xyz, where our goal is to provide freely accessible interactive orthopedic education for all. We are across all the social media platforms, so please do follow us there. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's uh, quite a lot of brand new video content. Um, and now we move on to our next speaker, who's uh, Deepa Bose. And Deepa's done a huge amount of work for World Orthopaedic Concern. It's very well known in the field. And she's going to be talking to us about the experience in the UK um, and also uh, across developing nations. Thank you, Deepa. Uh, thank you, Caroline, and uh, thank you to, to the organisers, in fact, for inviting me. Um, I, it's a great honour, and it's very exciting to be a part of this. Uh, it's a topic that's not just close to my heart, but so, so important, in fact, for the future of orthopaedics. Uh, so I'm going to speak to you a little bit about uh, diversity in orthopaedics uh, best practice in the UK, and then I'll mention a little bit about uh, work in developing countries. Uh, so first of all, why is diversity important in orthopedics or in any field? It's important because it allows you to pick the best people for the job, not just a small pool of people who are available to be picked. It gives you a better understanding of our patients because our populations are diverse. Uh, so we should be as well. And it also allows us to provide role models for future surgeons. There are a few um, sort of side effects or unintended consequences of diversity, which we do need to be aware of, such as an increased gender pay gap or a devaluation of the uh, profession. That, isn't, uh, that doesn't mean to say that these should be deterrents, uh, but we need to be aware of them so that we can address them. So if we start with medical students in the UK, we are extremely fortunate because we have uh, a lot of very, very uh, active surgical and orthopedic societies in our universities. So I know that the uh, University of Birmingham Orthopedic Society is extremely active. Uh, they recently held a webinar on women in orthopedics. And similarly, there are lots of other universities with very active societies. Becoming involved in those societies, um, because as they say, you can only uh, be or want to be what you can see. So if uh, we present those societies with diverse role models, then it becomes uh, evident to medical students quite early on in their career that it is possible to do orthopedics, uh, no matter what your background is. Uh, also engaging with medical students when they come to visit the hospitals in terms of their clinical attachments, etc. That's really quite important in terms of engaging them early on. Uh, speaking about training, uh, it's, it's actually very similar to what is happening in Australia. So uh, less than full-time training is now firmly entrenched in the UK. Um, and uh, the programs don't really have an option. Any trainee has the opportunity to go less than full-time and that must be accommodated for in the program. Uh, mentoring and peer support uh, is actually hugely important in encouraging diversity and uh, we're very lucky in the UK that we, we do uh, have a lot of diverse uh, role models and mentors to provide that. Uh, there's now a supported return to work program that is available to any trainee um, in any program and so that is supposed to ease the path back into training if someone's been away on maternity leave or some other kind of leave. And finally, there is now equitable parental leave. So that means that parental leave can be granted to either the mother or the father. And in fact, in our program right now, we have a male trainee who has taken parental leave because uh, his wife is a neurosurgical trainee. And the decision they took was that he would take the parental leave and she would return to work. To training earlier. So things are slowly changing with the help of all of these initiatives to support people who work less than full-time or who have family responsibilities. There's obviously more work to be done in the form of providing, say, places to breastfeed, creches, 
And although we call it flexible training, it probably isn't truly flexible yet because there are still some obstructions in the way. Um, retention of female trainees uh, is actually a big challenge in the UK and is now the topic of um, uh, quite a bit of research going on. So whilst there's still work to be done, uh, I feel that since I was in training, uh, we've, we've come quite a long way towards supporting uh, diversity in orthopedics. At the consultant level, we also have some very important initiatives, one of which is the Lady Estelle Wilson uh, Leadership uh, Fellowship. So this is a fellowship in clinical leadership, uh, which is open to women. Uh, we have the BOA, which is the British Orthopaedic Association, Diversity and Inclusion Policy and Action Plan. Uh, there's a lot of uh, support around looking at the composition of the committees and councils of different societies like the BOA and like the other specialist societies uh, to make sure that the membership is represented on the committee. And again, there is mentoring and support available at the level of a consultant. Uh, as was previously said, unconscious bias plays, uh, plays a really uh, big role in how people are selected for orthopedic training and how they progress through training, how they're examined and how they complete their training. And so training in unconscious bias, recognizing unconscious bias and equality and diversity training is now mandatory in the UK for all selection and interview panels including the Specialist Advisory Committee and the Training Programme Directors and Examiners. Uh, there is uh, also quite a lot of initiative around recognising and rewarding diversity, such as the, uh, the SAS doctors. So those are the staff grade and associate specialist doctors who are sometimes referred to as non-consultants, although I think it's a shame that they should be referred to as non-anything. Um, but there, there is uh, quite, a, quite a lot of uh, movement around recognizing people who aren't on traditional career pathways and recognizing their contribution. Uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about my work abroad. Now, the, the first thing that I would say is that I don't in any way, shape or form claim to represent other countries. I live and work in the UK, and that is where I practice, and so that is that is where uh, my knowledge lies. Uh, I, I wouldn't dream of saying that I represent uh, any other country because they have their own uh, women in orthopedics who can represent them very ably. But what I will say is that I, I do, as Caroline has said, I do a lot of work in developing countries. I'm chairman of an organization called World Orthopedic Concern. Uh, this is a charity that's affiliated with the BOA, and we do a lot of work around training and education in developing countries. And so the picture that you can see on the left-hand side is me teaching an Ilazarov course in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa. And then the picture on the right is uh, several female orthopedic surgeons graduating from Addis Ababa in 2017, several years later. I, this is not my achievement. It is a testament to the fact that Ethiopia has been very supportive of women in orthopedics. Um, and what that means is that there, there are now more female role models for people to see and to emulate. Uh, women in Surgery Africa is a, a very new organization. It's in its infancy. Um, and there isn't a separate orthopedic component to that but they, they have made great strides and they're, they're doing really great work in terms of providing role models and peer support. So, uh, as you will all know, there are lots of different supportive organizations to, that provide mentorship and peer support, uh, such as uh, the uh, IODA. In the UK, we have WINS, Women in Surgery, there's Women in Surgery Africa that I've just talked about, and then the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society, uh, the Australian societies that you've heard about. On a more local level, we have an organization called FEMERA, which is uh, female orthopedic surgeons in the UK. 
this was started uh, many years ago, about almost three decades ago, by uh, Ruth Case, who is a consultant orthopedic surgeon who used to practice in Western Supermare. She's now retired. Um, but Ruth started this about 30 years ago, and there are now uh, several different branches of femora in all the different regions. We provide informal mentorship and support. So um, what can we do to encourage diversity? I suspect you'll hear a lot of repetition in today's talks, which is a good thing because it means that we're all thinking along the same lines. So positive role models, early exposure at the level of the medical students, opportunities for less than full-time training, flexible training and flexible working, respectful challenge to outdated attitudes and behaviors, and this is where actually having male allies and friends can be very, very useful. Mentoring and peer support, uh, I agree with what was said that actually it doesn't matter who mentors you. Um, uh, uh, men and women play different roles in mentorship. Uh, equitable parental leave to allow for family life and research into the barriers as to why uh, women don't want to join orthopedics or why they leave early. So I hope that we will get uh, from the picture on the left, which is equality, where everyone's given the same box to stand on, uh, to the picture on the right, where actually no one needs a box because there are no barriers. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk, Deepa, and it's really interesting to see what's going on across the world. Um, so we've got a couple of questions from the audience which are, are general to the panel. Uh, one from Anna Carreiro, who wants to know, do you think that having an IODA student branch across the world could make medical students more of, aware of what you do? And that, that might be better towards Jenny for an answer. Well, IODA is open to students already. So students can join and we'd, we'd welcome students forming their own subcommittees and groups within IOTA. So they're most welcome. Great. And then Hamish wants to know, what's been the biggest challenge IODA has faced after the creation of the organisation? Oh, I think a lot of it is coordination, time zones. There's a great amount of enthusiasm, but there are, it's the time to do the work and set up things so that we can co coordinate and communicate easily. But I think it's very positive. There haven't been too many barriers. There's been a huge amount of enthusiasm. Great, thank you, Jenny. And then a question for Deepa from Kat Malik. Do you have a link for Femora? Uh, we don't actually. Uh, it's, it's quite an informal uh, thing, um, but uh, I, can, I can put my uh, details on the chat and I'm, I'm happy to give more information. Great, thank you. 